Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 12th Nifty webinar. I see that there are still a number of people joining us here, but I'd like to get started um, just to honor everyone that is here on time. So my name is Brianna Bowman. I am the National Technical Assistance Coordinator here at the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. This webinar is on the topic of incubator land management and teaching ecological land use and is hosted by the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association in partnership with the National Incubator Farm Training Initiative and made possible by generous support from Western SARE Professional Development Program Fund. A really excellent agenda in store for you today, which will begin with a technology orientation um, to the WebEx software, followed by an overview of the NIFTY program, and then we'll roll right into our presentations, beginning with Nathan Harkelrode, the Outreach and Education Program Manager at ALBA, followed by Dr. Peter Walker, the Dean of the Falk School of Sustainability at Chatham University, and finished by Aero Rutia the Technical Assistance and Incubator Farm Manager here at the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. We'll have an opportunity to present questions to the speakers at the end of the webinar, and then I'll leave you with some ways to continue moving forward with NIFTY. So, brief tech overview. All the participants are muted upon entry to eliminate background noise. If you see an option to change that, please do not. That'll ensure that everyone can hear our presenters clearly. Um, you'll be able to submit questions throughout the course of the presentations through using the chat box, but all the questions will be answered at the end. We will roll, hopefully, pretty smoothly from one speaker to the next. When you ask a question, please specify to whom your question is directed um, in the body of the question itself. Take a look at drop-down menu bar. If you're viewing on full screen, you'll see something that looks like what we have up on the slide here. Um, the chat option will allow you to ask questions. Just type those into the box and we'll sort through them at the end. Um, if you're having any audio issues, you can activate or adjust the audio using the audio tab. And if you want to exit full screen mode to view the participant list or the chat box, you can do so by hitting return. Right. A little information on Nifty, and I'll keep this brief because I know many of you are familiar with our programs. So NIFTY is a project of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project, which was founded in 1998 alongside its incubator farm project. NIFTY, however, didn't get its start until January of 2012, and NIFTY started in response to an uptick in requests for technical assistance from incubator farm projects nationwide. And NIFTY is designed to address the shared challenges of incubator farm projects and provide a forum for our community to exchange best practices and develop useful resources and really just come together a network of people doing very similar work. Uh, right now, NIFTY has 200 incubator farm projects or potential projects nationwide, and we're trying to keep course with this growth by continuing to de develop very practical tools and trainings. And right now, NIFTY is working on emphasizing regional collaboration, and there will be more opportunities to join in regional networks at the end of this webinar. The tools that NIFTY offers at the moment are an online library of training materials dedicated solely to incubator farm project development, um, webinars to this one, um, and a community of practice listserv as well, which engages over 200 incubator farm project staff with one another. Um, our National Field School, which will be held in Raleigh this year from October 7th to 9th, is another, another opportunity to connect with the network. And of course, uh, NIFTY does provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance free of charge to startup incubators across the country, provided by our excellent TA partners, Cultivating Community, the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association, International Rescue Committee, Intervale Center, and the Minnesota Food Association. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to uh, go ahead and pass the mic over to Nathan from ALBA. My name is Nathan Harcourt, and I'm the outreach 
Outreach and Education Program Manager with Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association, or ALBA. I'm honored to be able to present to this group on the topic of sustainable management and teaching ecological land use, and hope that my little bit of experience as a land manager and farm educator helps me deliver some useful information. First, a little on the ALBA context, context by talking about our organization and programs, particularly the Farm Incubator about the specific practices that we promote, what I like to call the pillars, is about how to manage these practices with large numbers of farmers. I illuminated it along the way, but I'll circle back on a few points later. I will conclude echo messages based on my experience as a protectioner in the field. Our 15-year history is a nonprofit and recorded about eight miles south of Salinas in the heart of the valley, in the middle of a multi-dollar labor-intensive ag industry, dominating large grower sh shippers. Known to eternal spring conditions and grow all the main cool season crops that you can think of, like this broccoli, cauliflower, celery, hence the salad bowl of the world. Out down to providing aspiring farmers, primarily the region's farm workers, providing all that labor, opportunities to establish their own organic family farms. Alban worker to farmer roots go all the way back to the 1970s, helping Latinos develop strawberry cooperatives. The models of farmer training and business development were developed through predator organizations in the 80s. The main fighter organic in 1992. They carried out by way of three programs. Each we enroll around 25 students in a farmer education program or PEPA for Cativo para Agricultores. And this three point for our participants that is, preparation to start a farm in a nine bilingual and college accredited course. This is for going into the organic farm incubator where participants can develop their farm businesses over a period of up to five years. We also distribute our farmers' produce if they so choose. Through our food organics. Incubator provides a reduced risk environment in which to start a business. One of these is to reduce the capital needed to get started. We still have access to land and equipment, and we embrace regulatory requirements. There's a lot of way through TA and classroom education. We do production, business, marketing. And are part of other areas. Overall, opportunities pass through ALBA, and farmers are able to tap into those as well as from each other. All this is based on our two ranches the Rural Men's Center and the Triple M Ranch. And many ranches are like yin and yang. The RD is in the heart of the Salinas Valley and has great, loamy, flat soil. Really speaking, is a more forgiving place to farm. It is no surprise that this is expensive land to lease with commercial rates for organic ground, often over dollars per acre per year. The majority of our incubator farmers are situated, and right now around 30. The land is hilly with soils ranging from loamy sand to clay. Some erosion risks. Given aspects and slopes, there are lots of microclimates. Both some great conservation improvements over the years. Windbreaks, hedgerows, albums, raptor perches, swells, and basins to name a few. For much of it, to get help from the RCS, primarily the Mental Quality and Census Program, or EQIP, suggests investigating this opportunity as organization and also encouraging your farmers to do so. The program costs similar improvements and offices that I will now be sharing with you. Okay, the first of the three pillars. As we're mandated to maintain or improve soil quality, we're highly encouraged to do cover cropping. This to be real and necessary for sustainable land management. If it's really worth noting, for cover cropping can really play into your weed management strategy. Weeds the eternal battle here at Alba. 
Weed only gets rated in surveys of organic growers as one of the top production challenges. Weed's going to be lighthearted or dismissive about. The low and really interesting work with rates of typical cereal legume cover crop mixes to better weeds crops can some other weed competition. Groundwater quality regulations in effect in our region to nutrient overloads. We are where one in ten rural communities cannot drink their water due to contamination. Cover crops are a key practice in helping clean up this problem. That hilly triple M most definitely needs something on the ground before any major winter rains to protect the ground from erosion. And hey, do the cover crops increase yields? Coming out of the ground in September and October, some of that ground goes into strawberries in November, and some can even be grown when harvested in the winter. As farmers put half their land in cover crop over the winter. Minus area land, air, and weather issues, we do a pretty good job of getting in the range of a quarter of the land in decent cover crop each year. Our farmers are expected to get their cover crops in by a specific date, year 15. And yet, we completely responsibility. They're really cropping too much, much as you can afford to do. Based on our experience, speaking to local professionals and farmers that we respect, both program manager and I have our favorite folks on speed dial for all these topics. We have very cooperative extension folks that will work closely with, with us, not only writing recommendations, but also in coming in for workshops and training for our farmers. Right down to the USDA's agricultural research stations, Salina the Organic Cropping Systems Trial, which is benefits of cover crops, compost, and rotations in the long term. A small grower, such as which tillage tool is the best for bearing when you don't have access to a grain drill. All you do needs to be adapted to your specific land needs, climate, and production systems. For critical, our crops go in too late and the soil gets cold, they don't fast, yet many of the weeds still do. For a deal, the rye is scrappy, comes fast. <clears throat> And even job of smothering the weeds. The vegetable legumes that our population of birds doesn't eat. The seeds of non-crop vegetation do not come for free. The vegetable with the rye. In dry years, the rye can hang in there even if the veg suffers. And we have cover crop seeds so that it is on hand when the timing is right. right. We sometimes get advice from professionals, farmers, and staff sometimes have different views too. Too. For example, local experts and farmers say that the legumes can be a serious host to verticillium wilt. This is for many of the crops that we grow, especially strawberries. Where oats, as new research comes out and is stated in the field. It in severe drought in California highlighted how conservation goals can sometimes compete with each other. For example, rain is meant bringing cover crops up with sprinkler irrigation, even irrigation over the winter. What can help with groundwater infiltration? Probably up, only up to a certain point. Once biomass, they are going to be transpiring a lot of groundwater. We have to adapt our cover crop strategy and sack some of the benefits of high biomass to not deplete groundwater resources. It's important to be out there providing some guidance and supervision, and we do have to be on top of some tenants. To make crops get in the ground to begin with, there can be and some farmers will just keep on planting. But as we diligently protect our land base, like all our farm equipment system is a bit scrapped together. For that next piece of equipment to do, to do this or that better, for cover drill that we could use to plant the seed uniformly and achieve a new level of efficiency, like how farmers out of their cash crops. In the ground, see if it's cover crops all at the same time. We can field day event and dedicate the use of the equipment. This is that we've been working on for some time.
difficulty of doing a good job cover cropping or any practice today is easy for granted. For cropping cycles in, in, cropping into the mix, and it becomes a real difficult juggling act. To help closely with our farmers and their crop, crop plans and not in the field to try to ensure success. of primary Latino growers that we have developed over the years as part of extend the reach of our work by creating products that can be mailed out and reused in our trainings. We read related to cover cropping for our region, management considerations, locals for TA, and suppliers. We have fairly accurate maps that were made that we used to keep track of can management activities, including cover cropping. And then we just fill them in over time. So that all the land receives cover crop through the simple record keeping system. We try to ripping, strawberries, and compost applications. This info is scanned and digitized. What I see is a second pillar of organic soils management. Many of these are familiar and robust organic systems. Thinking of soil fertility as the fuel tank of the car, the ASR production system. With cover crops and compost, only adding fertilizer as a top up when needed. Don't fertilizer your inputs, but I still see cover crops and compost as forming the base. Most all of our land either gets cover cropped or composted each year. We have found production, customer, and farmers' needs. Now, this is a real big challenge for beginning farmers. We're making our aspiring farmers on field trips to meet vendors as well as their products, build business relationships, and establish their own accounts with many of the local vendors. Now, the question comes up. Why do you not compost? The environment that we're in and the sheer scale of farming, it really makes sense to leave that to the pros. We have our options on compost too. Can too much be a bad thing? There suggests that there are minimal soil gains to be had beyond a certain application rate. And nitrogen application is going increasingly regulated in fact, most of us already have very high levels of phosphorus. Crop third pillar of good land management. I hope some of these basic benefits are starting to look familiar. Not optional in organic farming. And we have taken the extra step to formalize everything in writing with our farm lease agreements. Strategy when you have lots of farmers, many of plots each year, and base we're averaging two to three cycles of five different vegetable crops plus berries on a few hundred acres per farmer. I'm actions where there is abundant and affordable land, and which are like deliberate rotational plans. Are incredibly intensive to say the least. Our situation is to keep it simple. The planning of the same crops are generally crop families. But what we know to be bad, for example, planting strawberries after crops like tomatoes and peppers, which are mental soil diseases. We have potatoes based on our own experience with them creating soil disease issues. On the, we try to promote, promote what we know to be good. good. Sneaking and incorporating the residues before strawberries can help with pathogens. We have taught back the rotations, but are still ways from getting all of our farmers to take this important step. 
to be high tech. I learned this on a simple piece of graph paper. And this is increasingly asked for by organic certifier. Strawberry County and that Alba as well, taking up over a quarter of land and being up to as high as 6% of our sales volume in the summer. Our region has a serious competitive advantage for this crop and feeds right supply chain from April through October. A mechanic farmer trying to make a better living on relatively small acreage, but not special concerns. First off, it's an expensive crop to get into, requiring anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars up front. Clamber with lots of some bed work, plastic and planting all the way to August before reaching the break-even point. Our bank barrier can easily be $12,000. Rotation is that they're sensitive to soil disease. Add to that strawberry ground for up to 18 months or longer longer with that are being added. There are different fertilization and the puzzle like concrete for water infiltration. Because it developed specific policies related to strawberries. We are going to rotate into strawberries. We want how to grow less risky and capital intensive vegetables first. Practices to mitigate, mitigate and some of the land quality issues associated. The million in organic strays is how long between rotating back into strawberries. Some say four, and of course, many factors. We are paying attention to build up a soil disease and may happen in the future. Generally, to track your land management. This is called as you have more and more farmers, you need a system in place. All of our permanent blocks, we never look out land an acre time to keep the land accounting fairly straightforward. We keep together. So they continue learning as a group on their small half-acre plots. Next to our office, so we can keep a closer eye on them. You can understand farmers' plots fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Looking to expand. We try to keep relations in some of the same pieces of land, so they get as much as possible the opportunity from both their good and bad management practices and other operations out across the whole ranch. It's possible for convenience and efficiency. Yeah. ground in August and September. Horizon involved for supplies and ground preparation. We look to rotate the berries into. We get the up with commitments on cover crops. Closer during period, a great bargaining chip. We really this seriously, demonstrating progress on a range of different outcomes, including related to production and conservation. We have begun by year that will be much of the basis for continuing on in our programs. Conservation will only be one aspect that we are looking at. What is to know everything? just have nowhere to look. It is important it can help you with your land management plan. And there are a lot of USA programs like Enterprise Equip that can help financial burden of doing the right thing. On a side, you check out Eric Brennan's YouTube channel. You will be disappointed. He is really his research, research and sharing it in a fun way that is really concise and easy to follow. 
certainly added richness to my understanding in many of the points I have to say. productive demonstration site, you can involve yourselves and your farmers directly in research that helps answer questions relating production and sustainability and in a setting. So with UC Santa Cruz on a couple of projects right at Alba, related to reducing soil pathogen pressure in strawberries. This is rotations, new mustard meal, and aerobic soil disinfestation. As a live demonstration, this and all the findings into your curriculum over time. These sorts of benefit your participants can be found by different grants. These cover aspects of the related TA that you are already providing. Okay. Don't forget pillars of cover crop compost, and crop rotation, but seat losses like researchers, farmers, and other animals to adapt these practices to your needs. We have learned that with how the land manage, it's not helpful to put it all in writing by any means, but it doesn't help to put things in writing that you aren't actually committed to following through on. To have some basic system in place to track land management over time, especially those that are critical to the health of the soils. I hope that you think land management is not always black and white, and that is you have to be open to adapt, adapting as well as different perspectives, different conservation goals, along with farmer profitability. We have to give students and farmers the space to apply learning to real operations appropriate to their level of learning. Practices don't benefit the farmer nor the land, so we trust by providing direct support out in the field. This too for guidance and land management can also pay your farmers and back up your messages. Last, don't forget demonstration site gives you a chance to to experiment, and also what farmers will do. Time and attention. Please feel free to ask questions at the end of this webinar, or again, if you want to discuss any of the points in this webinar, or if you want to talk about ways that Alba may be of assistance to you. And from them to Peter Walker. Uh, Nathan and Alba are really sort of the grand old men of incubator farms, as it were. The university is just starting. I'm hoping to get our incubator farm up and running in about a year's time. To tell you a bit about the context in which we're trying to do it and what we're trying to achieve here, because we have a brand new campus, a brand new concept for the campus, a lot of money invested in it, and we're just about to start trying to produce an incubator I was going to say farm or at least rural livelihoods project, which is specific uh, to Pennsylvania. Now, some of you may know Pennsylvania, many of you may not. Uh, it's essentially one of those states where we still have family farms. Uh, in terms of the sort of uh, league table, state by state, we get teams on vegetable production, uh, milk from cows, we're fifth, and we're the top state in mushroom production uh, in terms of farm mushrooms and in terms of wild mushrooms uh, throughout the state. Where the linkage between farm and community, farm and consumption uh, has changed a lot over the years. We're now third in the states in terms of direct sales to consumers. And in terms of CSAs, uh, we're, we're fourth within the USA. So it's a state that's changing, where the cities are starting to take some uh, attention Happening and where the food's coming from. And we have, if you like, an ecosystem drawn there. Of course, like everybody, 
with the problem uh, that humans' understanding of food um, is all about cheap. So whereas uh, 42 cents of every dollar spent on food went to the farmer in 1975, last figures I saw for 2011, so 11 cents of every dollar spent on food went back to the farm. So effectively, um, farm becomes a harder and harder sell in terms of income. So what we're doing is we're trying to understand farming in the context of true sustainability. We started a new school of sustainability and a new campus. Our, our essential approach is to say that if you are really going to be a uh, sustainable community, it's, it's all about systems. You've got to understand the natural systems, the built, constructed systems, the social and economic systems. If you like, that's the lifeblood of any sustainable initiative. And those systems need to be underpinned by a, a real concern for social justice. You can't have a sustainable system that does not speak to social justice, and you can't have a sustainable system that does not speak to place. Just understanding the generics of how a water system works or a water cycle works really doesn't matter if you can't apply it to, in this case, uh, the Ohio River in Pittsburgh on a Friday afternoon just before we have a flash flood. Uh, and if you're going to do that, you have got to understand how those systems can be adapted over time. True sustainability is all about adaptation. So if you like the intellectual basis of what we're trying to do, where we're trying to do it, in a new site, uh, some 18 miles north of Pittsburgh, it's called uh, Edom, uh, Edom Hall. We've got 388 acres there, and as you can see from this Google shot, uh, half of it's woodland, about half of it's farmland. The road, ridge road, running right through the middle, and it is a ridge. We have a water table off to each side of it. Um, and as you can see in the middle there, the new campus building starting to be put in. That's where all that sort of light land is. Uh, soils. Um, well, the area was never glaciated, right? So these are pretty old soils. We're on land that's hilly, uh, not mountains. It's mostly heavily cut valleys into shale, uh, the famous shales that all the fracking is going on in. And so the soils tend to be very heavy clay with very thin topsoils. Flooding is a real problem for us. Um, nutrient content is pretty low. Many farms we've inherited here on this estate are pretty much worked out. So we are hoping um, over the next few years we're going to be teaching a number of degrees, uh, a bachelor's in sustainability and a master's, uh, master's in food studies, and then a joint degree in MBA. And agriculture and rural livelihoods come into all of these education offerings. Different about our campus is that what we inherited was basically land. And we've built a campus to be a sustainable campus from the ground up. That means a choice we've made about energy systems, types of building, water systems has all been about sustainability. In fact, we have five distant systems going on here which allow us to sort of teach off the back of them and build it into our agricultural agenda. So if I quickly flip around these, our energy systems Systems. We, we don't draw any, any energy from oil or coal. Our heating all comes from a geothermal system, and geothermal is really difficult to photograph. But in the foreground, those black pipes coming up, that's part of the geothermal loop that goes down underground. It essentially, it goes down about 400 feet. All these wells are connected into a loop, and in reality, the ground acts as a big storage system for heat. So that we have a heat exchanger above ground, uh, that exchanger pumps either hot or cold air into our buildings, and the reverse through the water down into the ground. So in the sun, when we're trying to cool buildings, uh, the exchanger is pumping heat into the ground and actually heats it up from the normal 57 degrees to make 80 degrees over an area where a few acres in size. And then in winter, when you flip the system round. You easily extract that heat, the heat buildings, and you 
you will cool down the ground in some places to almost freezing point. Uh, and then as summer hits, the source of cooling. The heat changer, of course, uh, it's basically like a dirty gripping refrigerator, you know, hot at one side, cold at the other. It needs to run off power, and the power comes from photovoltaic cells, or the roofs have got photocells on them, and all electricity comes from this. But we haven't managed to, um, in California, to give us any big storage units yet, uh, so no Tesla storage units. So basically sell the electricity back into the grid when we produce lots of it, and then buy it back from them when we need it at night or in winter. Overall, our balance with them is positive. We create more electricity on campus than we um, uh, use. Because shallow soils and the uh, steep slopes here, water management is a real issue. Pitts is also an area with a lot of summer rainfall, mostly coming as thunderstorms. We're doing two or three things to manage the water. Firstly, we recycle all of our own water on campus, and this is through uh, an artificial uh, marshland system. Here on the left, uh, going from here down to those field lands, are two artificial wetlands. Essentially, these are almost like gravel pits full of water, inoculated with bacteria and fungi, and in about a week's time, they'll be planted out with cattails. Water basically flows in at the two ends and flows through the soil to the middle being cleaned by the bacteria and fungi as it goes and filtered. Then off into a sand filter and a couple of other filters and eventually it's recycled for uh, um, irrigation or for toilet use or gets pumped out into leaching fields uh, where it's leached off into ground and introduced gradually into the water table. Uh, regulations here don't allow us to drink the water we produce, even though it's clean. Basically, we'd have to install a chlorination plant if we wanted to drink it, and that would defeats the purpose. The cool thing, though, that we are doing is all of the system is monitored. So everywhere along the system, we know 24-7 how much water is flowing. Um, we can monitor the speed of the flow, the volume of flow. Uh, all of this data becomes available for our students. To We're also looking at what happens to the water on the surface. So to control the flash floods, rather than having retention ponds, we've planted rain ponds, maybe 15, 16 of these throughout the campus, at points where we know water does gully in. Uh, gardens collect the water, allow it to seep into the landscape more slowly than you would in a normal environment. And likewise, wherever we're putting in hard surfaces like roads or walkways, uh, we don't use concrete or uh, blacktop. We're using a porous surface. So again, we reduce the amount of runoff. Uh, we do that even on this is an outdoor amphitheater that we have, and you can see there's a runoff course runs right through the amphitheater. It's an old stream that we've kept in place, and in garden uh, beneath the amphitheater. In fact, the stage sort of floats on it. So, <coughs> that's the system, but it also takes us into the social system. Um, this campus is in a peri-urban area. All around it used to be farms up until about 10 years ago, but now it's new housing developments. And these are all young, upwardly mobile families, um, the sort of people who are looking to get secondary degrees, uh, many of whom are looking to maybe have two or three different sources of income. So we build very much a community with them. We concert uh, the amphitheater for outdoor concerts, um, with opera, bluegrass, all sort of things out there. We put on community dinners. These are on to table dinners where we showcase the produce that we grow on the organic farm we have on campus. I think everything in that shop bar about two dishes actually comes from one of the pigs raised on the farm, just about every bit on it. And they also do science education. So we, uh, this particular class was a class on solar electricity uh, and installing them in own uh, backyard. The final bit of our sort of social outreach is through to K through 12 schools. So we have within our catchment about 40 schools and organize programs for those uh, kids on campus to experience the farm. Uh, the shot on the left is taken in one of our high tunnels. Uh, they also come on and do science experiments. And we work with the high school and the middle school teachers in the area 
that helped them build out their curricula and use the campus uh, as a form of education. So the whole point is that we're building a sustainable campus in engineering terms. We've invested about 56 million in it so far, and wanted to make it to become a socially sustainable campus. So where the community is very much part of what's going on, where our students, if they don't have a classroom, the entire campus is the classroom. Every system is a system they can get into, they can crawl around in and understand the data. And then, of course, the, the last bit uh, of our um, campus, the farm. What Harry said when we this place in 2010 was seven farms that had previously been on the estate of one of the founders of the Heinz Corporation. Heinz Ketchup is made here in Pittsburgh. Um, and, and these were being tenant farmers that eventually you know, went out of business. So we're dealing with land that's been pretty much worked out. Um, so the land at the top left there is what it looks like most of the uh, uh, farming land around us is, is flow. It's starting to regenerate back to scrubland. Uh, move around to the top right. When you do want to farm, uh, almost anything here, we have the largest and most dense deer population in the United States, you have to deer fence it. To have an eight foot fence around just about anything you want to grow. Um, it can work. So the bottom left there is a, a student experimental garden we have about an acre where uh, our students can come up with their own experiments, so whether it's in cropping, uh, growing crops that used to grow in the area. So what we love is uh, Pittsburgh used to be the, the production center for whiskey in the United States during the sort of Wild West days, 85% of all rye whiskey was grown in Pit was made in Pittsburgh. Um, it completely died out. I now have two micro distillers starting it up again. Only what they want to do is revive some of the old varieties of rye and some of the old varieties of hops that we used and start their own yeast production again. So we are now experimenting on our farm with can we grow those old varieties and is there a way we could get a commercially viable yeast production system going again. And finally, uh, Pittsburgh has winters. Uh, we do have quite cold winters. So we've invested in um, a hoop house or two to grow throughout the year. And indeed, our largest one is solar powered with the massive solar panels. Basically, the panels heat water up. And winter, this allows us to keep the temperature in that solar tunnel above about 45 uh, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. This year we had five days where it dropped down below freezing, but that's when it was minus 20 Fahrenheit outside with a 35 mile an hour wind. Just had to use propane heaters to keep it going. So we have these solar tunnels that are going to be available for our incubator farmers as well. We have sort of the, the capital of mushroom production. Um, so we're also experimenting with commercial ways of growing. Uh, oyster mushrooms and sharky mushrooms and that we're having with a number of other colleges up the East Coast basically has as a bottom line that we wind a way of by producing uh, sharky mushrooms on a farm to give you an extra $10,000 income a year using a base that you already have but are, are not using. And it works out that actually the biggest issue is around how do you market? How do you transport them and market these things? How do you get them from the rural environment to the middle of a city like Boston or Philadelphia where they can fetch up to $18 a pound? The final farm system we have is aquaculture system. This one is modeled, if any of you know, off the Freshwater Institute in um, Virginia. In fact, they designed it and installed it. Each tank holds about 600 gallons. Uh, we're commissioning it uh, in, in August and start production thereafter. And again, it's all about looking at what are the ways in which you could use aquaculture, either just fish production or fish production tied into plant production for an aquaponics system uh, as a way of increasing the um, income per acre that you get out of a farm. With, we think if a farm that does a number of things, it's first and foremost a teaching farm 
our bachelor's students and our master's students. It's a rich farm, uh, research, but very practical research, research that's all about how to help Pittsburgh and the, the and around Pittsburgh re revive itself. Uh, something of a production farm. We produce all the uh, um, vegetables for our own canteen uh, on campus. And it's a demonstration farm. We want to be able to demonstrate new techniques and have farmers coming in and looking at. And finally, it's an entrepreneurial farm. It's really where the idea of the incubator farm comes in and where I really need to learn from you guys how we take this forward. What we're looking at, though, is, is I think not just farming. What we're seeing in our area is a typical farm, Pennsylvania farm like this, earns income and needs to earn income from a possible source it can. So it's about harnessing wind energy. Yes, it's about cash crops. It's about offering educational visits. It's about tourism, aquaculture, direct sales. Uh, we've got an increasing number of farms in this area making direct contact contracts with restaurants, particularly high-end restaurants, where institution leverages the other. The farm advertises the restaurant. The restaurant advertises the farm. They do joint farm-to-table dinners. And, um, really trying to move, move that forward. We see a lot of our farmers doing a lot more on-farm production, uh, processing of food, so that you keep the value there uh, on campus. And what we are hoping to start next year is something like 10 acres of our land in course half acre plots, and all this to entrepreneurs who want to start I sort of hesitate to say just farm, but rural-based, land-based businesses, uh, whether it's um, primarily a business about, about selling food or supply, ch supply chain of food. We've got uh, one project, for instance, where you have a young couple who their business proposition is to sell water salads to business people for their lunch breaks in Pittsburgh. That means they need their own source of salad vegetables if they're really going to make a profit out of this. So the business end of it is all about how do you, through smart apps, get that sort of delivery, just in time delivery for lunches. But the back end is how do we sustainably produce crops to do that? What we're trying to do on the campus, as I said, we're just starting up, and basically um, I'm here to learn from you guys. So I will leave mine at that, and I'll now try and pass the ball over. Right? Uh, to bring. And Arrow will take over from here. Well, so my name again is uh, Arrow Rutella, and I'm the uh, incubator farm coordinator for the uh, New Entry Sustainable Farming Project. And as a uh, farmer, I manage two physical farm sites in Dracut, Massachusetts. So farm sites, much smaller scale than what we're seeing there from Nathan's presentation and, and certainly uh, nowhere near as capitalized as uh, what Peter is describing at the uh, facilities that are being developed there at the uh, chapter. Um, university facility. Um, but anyway, we have we have two four-acre farm parcels in Drake, and then we lease a couple of acres from a 30-acre farm in Newburyport, which is about 50 miles. Um, I'm sorry, about 40 miles from our um, uh, Lowell uh, Central location. And in my third year as the incubator farmer coordinator, so I'm still in the process of up, um, the programs and the best way of delivering information to our community of incubator farmers that are coming into our farm sites. My background is I was a commercial organic vegetable grower operate at a larger scale than our incubator plots, but nowhere near the scale of 
uh, what was uh, being talked about in the Salinas Valley. The Northeast, um, kind of edge scale, the organic commercial farms are somewhere in the 10 acre to uh, uh, 60, 70 acre uh, vicinity. And, and I was uh, managing a nonprofit organic farm for, for about 20 years, uh, represented about 40 acres of, uh, of uh, uh, production. Uh, using both uh, cover crops and fallow, fallow acreage and um, and cash crops uh, over those 40 acres. Um, I farm business planning course as a precursor to entry into the uh, um, to the uh, incubator farmer plots. If our graduates of the farm business management class, uh, they come in to quarter acre parcels. That's where the beginning is. And um, they are allowed to have a three year, 10 year incubator farm plots. And, um, and a, a few, if space is available, are able to expand their, their plots up to uh, a half acre. But most of them stay in the same quarter acre plot for the three years. And part of what I think is useful for them to learn is. Uh, the effects of their management practices on areas of land that they're responsible for. Particularly weeds is, uh, you know, the issue of, of weed management is critical to understanding their, their, uh, their monthly and, and, and annual practices and that. Um, integral to our program is that we want everybody to do an annual soil test. Uh, advocating for um, crop rotation of the annual cash crops. Uh, soil amendments are in compliance with certified organic practices, although we're not certified organic. And we're trying to um, demonstrate either through fallow acreage or on their individual plots some utilization of uh, legume cover crops, strulches, and compost. And Individually, um, any incubator that leaves a plot, then the following year we fill that plot for one year. And those fallow plots, illustrations of different um, strategies of how we can use cover crops where there are no cash crops for uh, one year. So, um, all hours in that, we, we want to start them off with a soil test, and so that's really the beginning, and so that they have understanding of the baseline of what they're operating from. And the test that you know we are utilizing come from the um, extension service here in, in uh, Massachusetts or Connecticut. Um, I have them do a soil test each year. Uh, our hope is that they can start to see uh, in, in some way, um, uh, the tracking of their fertility and seeing if they're influencing that fertility through these um, soil tests. pH is uh, very important for them to understand, and um, and our soils are are normally acidic, and so uh, then we're coming into to parcels where there's a need to uh, bring that pH up, and also uh, we're looking at you know calcium and magnesium and discussing the appropriate forms of lime for their, their uh, particular soils. Here, uh, we have some uh, field, uh, workshops uh, just when they're starting to get out into the plots and we talk about soil fertility. And, uh, and we use their soil test results, those reports, and that as a, as a means of um, discussing their plots and, and showing them uh, some of the techniques through uh, cooperative extension that of, of available information that to be able to interpret the, the soil test reports and with the goal of bringing their soils into uh, optimum level for uh, good, good uh, vegetable crops. And you know, uh, kind of mentioned, you know, the lime is in, pH is very important on on our more acidic soils and that. And so one of the baselines that 
we are mindful of is is um, is watching the rise and fall of the pH through uh, intensive cropping practices uh, year to year. All we want to see um, with the well tests and that that that, um, that there are our micronutrients are are in in uh, the appropriate levels, and and use graphs like this to show them the um, benefit of being uh, somewhere in the six to seven range for pH, and the availability of uh, uh, macronutrients like phosphorus and potassium and calcium, and ideally the you know how they should be in that range and and, and how they are available in the uh, six to seven uh, range. And uh, some of the micronutrients, um, as um, as they also are available or not available, if if they're not in that um, ideal pH range. Um, try to um, you know well, our goal is is for our growers to be using um, um, materials that are applicable to a certified organic program, and so we are. You know, getting four different materials that would follow compliance with those programs, and show them the rates of the, um, the nutrients of you know nitrogen, potassium, uh, phosphorus, and 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 different um, organic materials of, of how most quantities would would be expected to be found utilizing those materials. And also the relative availability of of the uh, individual properties, and 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 so um, you know, and making them aware that that there's quite a variation in what would be available from different materials, and and more importantly, um, you know, how available or how slowly they become available um, as as they're using uh, different amendments that fall within the compliance of the organic program. Oh, utilizing the um, soil test reports, in that, uh, we have them um, charts of different vegetables and these that they would be traditionally pulling. Um, and so, an example of something like, say, for snap beans, which have a lower requirement of nitrogen, on a chart like this, they would see uh, snap beans needing uh, 30 pounds of nitrogen as opposed to. Uh, a crop that we would pull uh, quite a bit more out, something like tomatoes, or where they would be looking to uh, to uh, have uh, 200 pounds of nitrogen available to show them the differences of availability of, of uh, individual crops. So our, let's say that if they're um, growing carrots, um, they want to make sure that in the area where the carrots are, they have a good supply of, uh, of potassium um, and uh, something like, uh, say, finish that potassium requirement is not nearly as, as important. And understanding for the uh, incubated farmers that that uh, as they're purchasing uh, soil amendments and that is to be aware of, of how soil amendments are sold. And uh, what I've found is a uh, 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 very important to uh, uh, promote is, is is that as they are buying, say, some of these blended bag fertilizers, and that 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 in, uh, available is is based on the percentage of uh, N, P, and K in these blends. And so, uh, a 50 pound bag of of, uh, of a you know a 50 pound bag of fertilizer is not going to provide. 50 pounds of fertilizer, but the the numbers that are in those bags are basically percentages in that. And so, um, if they were to buy, okay, what you see in the left hand corner, a cheap, 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 and it says four, three, three. Well, four of that 50 pound bag is nitrogen, or there's two pounds of nitrogen in that 50 pound bag, and there's a pound and a half of available phosphorus in that. 50 pound bag and, and a pound and a half of potassium in that 50 pound bag. Um, and so, starting the available 
well, chemical nutrients in that, but we also want to uh, advocate for and speak for organic matter and its influence on soil biology uh, and the importance of um, incorporating crop residues. And, and and also the importance of, of having organic matter that's coming off of cover crops that will nurture that soil biology. Of our concerns that we have on our plots, and, and that has to do with the aggressive nature of uh, tillers and uh, walking tractors with uh, with tillers on that. And so we um, really speak for minimizing the uh, aggressive uh, uh, soil touch and 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 looking for means of, of growing crops where there's not a constant use of rotators on that to provide um, good soil uh, structure, uh, good good um, planting areas and and good it's for their direct seeded crops. And, uh, so anyway, so it, so. Um, by uh, having fallow crops where we're utilizing cover crops adjacent to their cash crops and that their growers are able to um, witness and, 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 and experience some of these cover crops that are part of bringing in uh, organic matter into their, into their farm plots. And we want to uh, share some of the techniques of how do we fit cover crops into uh, cash crop vegetable production system. Only um, bringing legumes as, as green manure crops is, is a wonderful way of bringing nitrogen into the system. The opportunity of fixing uh, pounds of nitrogen preceding their vegetable crops. And so there's a this challenge of uh, how can we bring some um, green manure cover crops and integrate them to their cash cropping systems. Do here is is um, um, with the uh, use of a number of sites, some coming from my pre farm, and and some demonstrating some examples of of our incubator growers um, utilizing some form of the techniques of these uh, utilization of cover crops. You know how how can we uh, meet this challenge of fitting um, crops, which are going to be bringing in lots of biomass. And uh, provide uh, an improvement of of, uh, of uh, soil tilth and that into these cash cropping systems, and and also looking at how can we can appropriate space where we're reducing some of the tillage that's happening in our pots. And so one of the primary crops that can be used as a as a fallow for parcels that are not being uh, Farmed by the incubator farmers and adjacent incubator farmers is using a fuel P and O, uh, either a summer or a one year fallow. And in the springtime, um, with their, uh, in a bare field, and that we would spin fuel P and O. And, and, and this is an illustration on an incubator plot of where the fuel peas and oats have been seeded into a field in preparation for fall planted garlic. And uh, um, demonstrating here young pea tendrils that are coming off this this mixture of uh, fallow summer cover crop of field peas and oats has uh, a, a great uh, uh, potential for earning income. And and uh, and this particular incubator farmer was able to realize uh, a couple of thousand dollars of income from the pea shoots, which were really part of the summer fallow as the setup for the uh, garlic in the fall, picky young pea shoots uh, in this uh, summer fallow field. Um, and later in the season, we let the peas and oats mature, uh, reincorporate them, and have uh, you know, late late summer uh, and then and then that can either uh, um, over winter and provide uh, a great environment for the following year of of uh, of uh, cash crops with real need for any kind of nitrogen for the for the next year or back to this field where the incubator farmers. Uh, left-hand section of that field 
Um, that area was designated. It was uh, the second flush of peas and oats were tilled under then that provided a place for the uh, fall garlic to be planted. And then here we are with the next spring, and the garlic is fertilized from that uh, spring and summer fallow of peas and oats. And the next year, where they had uh, multiple crops of cash crop, vegetable crops, and that they're starting up another fallow section of peas and oats for that because realizing the income that's coming off that pea and oat uh, cover crop mix. Growers that um, you know where where there can be difficulties of, uh, for fall or late summer and fall planted um, uh, crop that are spaced with enough room between rows and that here we're demonstrating that we can spin uh, to rye between broccoli and grow both the fall broccoli crop and establish a good stand of uh, of wood rye, which will overwinter well. So here we are, we're, uh, we've spun rye into a broccoli field. Rye to grow. The rye continues to grow later in the fall. And then late December, the, uh, you know, the, we're done harvesting the broccoli. It's too late to get in to seed the rye, but that rye was seeded back in September, and there's a good stand of, good stand of winter rye there to protect that field through the winter. We're able to kill uh, in the Northeast winter rye and vetch by going at pond stage the following spring, usually the uh, beginning of June. And then, uh, you know, by extending that um, over crop mix into the uh, early part of the growing year, that will fertilize crops that will come um, summer into the fall. And so we're using that the, over, uh, the fall seeded and, and overwinter window to grow the cover crop. Up later planted um, crop later in the season and an incubator farm plot. And uh, we have our winter run and, and vetch that's at that flowering stage, which is the time to kill it. And inside a narrow profile harrow, but a very heavy harrow that's able to knock down that winter rye and vetch. That's a setup for midsummer or late summer planting following the winter rye and vetch. And and we've gotten that biomass and that nitrogen that's come from that grain leggy mixture. Uh, we use uh, winter rye for short windows. Winter rye has the capacity of scavenging uh, leftover nutrients, particularly nitrogen, from previous crops and that. And so we use this strategy as a weed management tool and also a, a means of getting some starter fertilizer for uh, later in spring planted crops. And so early spring on bare areas, we can seed winter rye, set it and grow for about six weeks. And um, so let's say if that were seeded in early April, by the end of May, we could knock it down. It would be in 20 or 30 pounds of nitrogen that is scavenged. So it does a great job of, uh, of pressing some of the weeds that will come up with that rye. And then a much cleaner field to follow up with with uh, a later seeding in, in early June. So we're using it as, as both a kind of a, st a starter fertilizer and, and as a way of managing weeds and that and with a short window of time with that cover crop. Another example of using overwintered rye is, is that we cut strips in a rye field. And, and uh, overwintered rye and vetch here. Strips grow, and then all over any spaces we plant um, white based crops such as uh, winter squash or pumpkins. And then down the rye and vetch, you know, winter squash and, and, and um, our pumpkins continue to grow. And that rye is the, is the squash. And pumpkin plants start to vine out, and we can put clover in here. So now we're establishing our clover crop. And the the uh, the, the, uh, curcumin, the squash in that winter rye. I'm sorry, the the the, uh, the winter uh, winter squash fills out that area. The uh, clover is sprouted underneath that, and it's harvested. The clover strips are there. Dormant underneath that canopy. As they're exposed to light, they fill in later in the fall. 
In the fall, it fills in very well. And then next we have a good set of clover that's a setup for strips. And these strips, we can plant uh, a different plant family. Here we're using tomatoes. And then nice by those by the preceding clover crop. And we're able to, by mowing, manage weeds that come in those aisles and have a great place for also harvesting our tomatoes. And not, we can do that. Um, here, our growers are, are incorporating this strip concept of, um, of uh, oat clover planted between their plastic with the idea that as, this, as these broscas come out of this field and that, we'll that um, Bindable plastic, and then the uh, clover uh, will move throughout that field in a similar way. Our, uh, the spring on on uh, incubator uh, incubator farmers plot, cutting strips and clover to uh, nurture um, uh, a summer crop of uh, broccoli and collards. And um, Here's the cover crop that we use for bringing biomass in a field in the summer, a good summer fallow, Sudan grass. We must keep it from getting too stocky. And then in the summer, we just sow it with clover. You can see where we put the clover down, we're establishing our clover for the next year for our next fallow. Buckwheat is, is a great weed suppressant. It's a great setup crop for, say, seeded crops midsummer to uh, um, late summer, such as carrots. And it only takes about 40, 45 days, so it's a short window in the middle of a longer growing season. Great for pulling up seeds. Crops come in the backside of it, and sometimes we'll have strips of, of buckwheat plant is also a crop bringing in beneficial insects into our field. To incorporate, we have a crop that can come on the back side of it and after that 45-day period, midsummer. And are you know, also uh, advocating for straw mulches um, as, as a, as a uh, kind of other technique of uh, bringing organic matter into our plots. Uh, using uh, residue from cover crops and that into our plot areas. I said here that my time is up, but hopefully there were a few ideas that you know can be useful of integrating these um, crops into uh, cash crops in the context of a incubator farmer situation. Great, thank you, Arrow, and thank you to Peter and Nathan. Um, not to worry if you didn't have a chance to write all of that down, I'll be sending out the uh, link to this webinar um, shortly after the conclusion of the event today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and run through some of the questions that we've received. I will go ahead and direct them to the speaker, and then um, Nathan and Peter, I'll unmute you as the question is asked so you can go ahead and respond. Um, the first question that we have is for Nathan. Uh, Nathan, why do you recommend a set rate of compost application? Have you thought about setting compost application rate based on soil and compost tests and a projected nitrogen and or phosphorus budgets? And Nathan, I will go ahead and let you respond now. Yeah, question. And, um, you know, of course, doing your soil tests is really the, the base of your whole fertility program. You got to go in and see what's there based on, on recommendations. Um, so, you know, yeah, we just go with the five tons to the acre as the minimum, and some farmers are applying more. You know, just care of our soils and the intensity of farming. That's um, really the end that you get from the compost at that rate. You might have 100 pounds, and maybe it's available right away. So it's just a drop in the boards most of the, the crop needs. Um, yeah, we're still working on the whole education piece around helping farmers 
undersold tests and do budgeting. Um, we've been fortunate to work with the NRS and a lot of our farmers get NRCS equip contracts and management is a is a practice that farmers can qualify for. for and part of that process, they go through some of the the budget process for particularly nitrogen. And that's the the nutrients um, moved by the crops in most area for uh, environmental reasons. Thank you. Um, and we do have another question for you as well. How many years do you allow an incubator farmer to stay on the farm? Question. So, you know, historically, um, Alba had 150 acres and, um, you know, our tendency has been increasing over the years. And really, it wasn't until 2012 that all of the land was leased out to people actually in our program. Prior some of the land out to commercial farmers. Um, and uh, anyhow, every 2012, all the land has been leased out. out. We pull the land. And longer than uh, we had some tenants stay in the land for seven years, ten years or longer. A couple were grandfathered in with the organization found in 2001. But in this lease out, we've had to really look at the, the tenor incubator. It doesn't really give folks much good to stay too long. They get too comfortable and in the business of helping people become independent. So, so for the amount of time that people, people can stay with us, and now um, we have a four-year max, though so if you have some land availability, uh, we belong for a year as commercial farmers. And um, something I mentioned to our triple ranch, uh, really historically we've leased that out to mostly commercial farmers, and we started a little bit as a stepping stone for people leaving our incubator. At, um, the incubator at the World Development Center in Salinas. I stay there for uh, one or two years. Great. While we have you on the mic, there is one more question for you. Um, how do you handle insurance for each farmer, and what is the typical yearly rental? Yeah, several different types of insurance that um, farmers to get. Um, have employees they have to get workers insurance the other end is liability insurance and and we must to get that in their first year farming in our incubator and it's um, kind of, but you know we have month long class and we occur together as a class and generate produce sales and after sales um the folks that come into our incubator get a little bit of a credit, and that guide towards um, rent or, or liability insurance. And um, yeah, you know, you know farmers already get their liability insurance where they choose. Uh, but we require a million dollar policy, and, and with Alba listed as an additional insured. And um, King, I think the the list that people are getting are in the range of, of three to five hundred dollars per year. And Ara, while we're on the subject, um, can you speak to how New Entry handles insurance for each farmer and what the typical yearly rental is for our incubators? Uh, rental for our, our plots is based on $700 an acre, so at quarter acre plots, you know, it's the, that percentage of that. And then we use uh, local farm and family insurance agents, and they need to have uh, both liability and, and, and product. Um, I mean, so personal bodily injury insurance and um, product liability insurance, and so that comes from farm and family, and it's roughly around four to five hundred dollars, um, depending on which agent they're they're talking to. Great, thank you. And then we have a couple questions here for Arrow that are fairly similar. Um, the first is, what is Arrow using to cut strips into cover crops and to drill clover into the strips? The second related question. How do you need cover crops with a grain drill or a different method? Um, on Marm, I had a spader for cutting strips, and a spader could um, 
really handle kind of any kind of cover crop um, at kind of any stage of growth. At the incubator farm plots, the soils are much cleaner, uh, and so a spader would not work. And so we have a, 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 a normal profile, very heavy Athens travel harrow, and so that would cut strips that would be two beds wide. Or if I can get into the over cover crops early enough, I can use a Perfecta field cultivator, which would give individual um, bed width strips. And I would have to run through that a few times to um, set back the overwintered cover crop, uh, but it would need to be done when they're at a young stage of growth. Uh, regarding seeding, um, and um, I use uh, just a uh, other uh, uh, spender, and uh, depending on what the different cover crops are, I, I seed them individually, and then I use a perfecta to heroin uh, seed uh, to uh, hairy vetch and the clover we have a coldy packer and so um, we use the coldy packer to uh, press that seed in uh, if, if the seed is small. Thank you um, and we have another question for Arrow. Um, Arrow you said that soil tests are done each year. Does new entry pay for the tests or are other farmers expected to pay? Um, well, the, the, there's uh pay for their pick tests and we have a workshop and so we do a demonstration of how to um pull soil samples and and then how to interpret those soil tests. Excellent. And Nathan, did you want to mention something about rental uh prices at Alba? Yeah, so the the land lease at our rural development center is uh based on a commercial rate of nine dollars per year. And uh, farms pay a subsidized rate based on which year they are in our incubator. So, the someone would pay 40% of that commercial rate, and um, each, uh, the percentage they pay goes up. So, that in their in their last year, they're paying at least 75% of the commercial rate, all in for the the real world outside of Alba. Great, thank you. Um, any last questions? I'll give you a moment here to type and send them in. If not, I will move on to talking a little bit about um, follow-up from this webinar and what you can expect from NIFTY. So after the webinar, you will receive a link to a follow-up evaluation. This will be short and sweet and will help us ensure continued quality programming through the National Incubator Farm Training Initiative. Uh, you'll also receive a link to the recorded webinar and a link to NIFTY's other resources and upcoming events. And please mark your calendars for our national Field School in Raleigh, October 7th through 9th. We would love to see you there. Um, it doesn't look like we have more questions, so I'd just like to give a big thank you to Nathan, Peter, and Arrow for everything that you've shared. I think this was a fantastic presentation touching many different scales. And for everyone who participated, thank you for joining us. Um, I will look forward to hearing your feedback.